And welcome. This is PwC's 10th Family Business Survey launch event for Nigeria. I'm Uma Kainwal, Director in the Private Client Services team here in Nigeria, specializing in family businesses and foundations. It gives me immense pleasure to host this event. I extend our sincere thanks to all our participants and eminent panelists for spending your valuable time with us for the next hour. Why do we make so much of noise about family businesses? Numbers speak for themselves. Family businesses are essential to the success of the global economy. They are responsible for half the global GDP and employment. The largest 750 alone have combined revenues of 9 trillion and employ 30 million people. In fact, it's more skewed in Nigeria, the balance. Based on their significance, it is crucial for lasting family businesses to emerge in Nigeria if Nigeria is to realize its desired growth potential of 4 to 6% per annum. As the global leaders of family business, looking after 83% of the world's largest family business, family office of foundations, it is our role to bring you the best ideas and options to your attention. Our 10th Family Business Survey captures key themes, building on data we have gathered over the last 20 years. The survey is run every two years. This survey, of course, covered the torrid times during COVID. While several businesses thrived relatively well, the pandemic revealed some of the lapses and lags amongst family businesses in Nigeria. At the heart of the matter is the need to build trust, improve on effective governance, leverage digitalization, and embrace innovative, sustainable financing for business expansion. And to give us the highlights of the Family Business Survey Nigeria results and its implications for Nigerian family businesses, policymakers, and other stakeholders, I would like to introduce partner, private and family business leader, and my dear colleague, Asiri Abey. Asiri leads the team that provides specialized services to high net worth families, next generation family members, and entrepreneurs. In addition, she has deep experience and expertise in international tax, having worked in New York, prior to Nigeria. Isiri, welcome. Thank you very much, Uma. And without um, ado, I would move very quickly into the presentation and the findings. So Uma has given a brief overview of how we conducted this survey, which actually covered several decision makers across 87 territories, including Nigeria. We've also, in the process, handled interviews with each of these decision makers, just so we get into the heart of the matter. What were our findings? There were four key themes which Umar has alluded to as well in our opening speech, 
And I'll look at those during this presentation, but also break down how we've asked those questions and the responses we've got from family businesses. The first theme being growth reduced during the pandemic, but businesses were resilient. And Nigeria was not left out in this story. But actually, what we do find as well is that a lot more Nigerian family businesses are very optimistic about exceptional growth come 2022, so about 94%. They're also determined to take responsibility to lead. We asked some questions around what are the, which of the following best describes your company's ambitions for 2021 and 2022? But we also asked what they felt would be their growth rates in 2020 when the pandemic hit. And quite a number of family businesses, 41% to be precise, felt that their business or sales growth will decline significantly. It's not far off from the global results. When we asked about how they were able to manage during the pandemic, a lot more family businesses in Nigeria tended to provide less staff support than the global average but we're more likely to make some sort of financial sacrifice, even as much as reducing their own salaries, but not at the expense of dividends to shareholders. We asked the question about how likely it was that they would um, grow or what were the growth areas for the next two years. And what topped the chart was increasing or introducing new products, I guess to also improve the diversity with growth, and also rethink their business models. But well, what did not top the chart was anything around carbon footprint or sustainability. Then we asked about the traditional or forms of financing, and a lot more were geared or leaned towards traditional forms of financing, including their operational cash flows, than they did towards private equity and banks. And you see the numbers there are increasingly 47% which is less than the global average of 62%. The next theme we found was governance was very weak or is very weak, except changes have been made so dramatically in the short time. 50% of family businesses have some form of governance policy or procedure in place, down from 84% when we asked the same question in 2018, but there are significant gaps. And family businesses do need to apply the same focus and professionalism to family and business governance that's applied to business strategy and operational decisions. We ask questions around policies and procedures that family businesses have taken on board. And it was surprising that compared to the global average, the Nigerian numbers were rather low where we didn't have shareholders' agreements, dividend policies in place, or family constitutions. But more distressing was that 50% of the businesses did not even have any of these governance structures in place. We asked the question about the next-gen involvement, and the Nigerian involvement was pretty low compared to global average, at 38% compared to 55% at the global level. And then we proceeded to ask about over the next five years, was there going to be any shift in your governance structures? And yes, the answer was overwhelmingly that a lot more businesses would tend to move from being owner managed and family managed to then being family controlled and family owned. Over the longer term, what did Nigerian family businesses want to create in terms of legacy and creating dividends for family members? That tops the charts, and 90% of Nigerian family businesses feel that way. And the next key thing we then saw was around sustainability. We asked questions around this, and we see a consistent theme across the global um, phase or the global market as well as Nigeria. A lot of family businesses want to be leaders on sustainability. In fact, 55% of respondents say that they are ready and willing to adopt this role. But only 39% name sustainability issues as a strategic priority. What were the questions we asked that drove us to this conclusion? We asked questions around 
how tax was going to be viewed from the family business perspective. And I think with sustainability, there's a lot now hovering around not only governance, but social matters and also environmental matters. And with social matters, tax then becomes a big cost to discuss. Is that something that would be done honestly or dishonestly? How much more information do we want to disclose? A lot of family businesses, which is interesting for Nigeria, felt that they saw tax. There was value in paying their fair share of taxes. And that number was 53%, which also ranks very favorably with what we see globally. So despite the fact that there's a lot of cry around multiple taxation and taxes not being fairly dealt with or handed down to businesses, there's still a willingness to pay their fair share of taxes. But I guess the question then is why is there a distance behind paying those and why is there a distance between government and the private sector? We also did ask questions around how they would play a part in the economy and family businesses felt favorable towards that. They felt there was a need to adopt sustainable policies to succeed, which is higher than the global average. When we asked the question around philanthropy, overwhelmingly, 91% of Nigerian family businesses engage in some form of social responsibility activities. And this was really very impressive. And I'm sure a lot of us did not go without the news during the period of the pandemic, where a lot of businesses and individuals were donating generously for the course. And so I'm not surprised by these figures and actually really impressed. But what was there in terms of the gaps was the question around, are you doing this to make an impact? Are you doing this strategically? Is there any structure really around the donations or not? And what we found was that a lot less family businesses had any strategy or structure around their philanthropy or giving. The last key, key theme that we touched on was on digitizing, digitalization. And most family businesses do not have the digital tools and capabilities needed for a rapidly changing world. While digital has been on the agenda for family businesses for years, 80% told us they were concerned about technology in our 2018 survey. Let's see the results for 2021. Almost 60% of Nigerian family businesses did acknowledge this year that they are strong in digital capabilities, or they are not strong in digital capabilities, pardon me, but only 34% deem this a priority. I guess as we have the discussions in the panel, we'll begin to ask more questions around some of these areas where we're seeing gaps. In conclusion, there are four immediate actions that we've identified. The survey itself actually gives us good news. There is good news there in the findings, but especially as it relates to the business resilience of um, Nigerian family businesses. But it is also a wake-up call for us. The financial resilience of Nigerian family businesses makes us well-placed to succeed but there needs to be a revisit of the lens on yourselves and on ourselves and the wider society and not just restricted to shareholders. Family businesses must begin to revisit purpose and use the trust that has been gained to create measurable non-financial impact. And these are the five key areas for immediate action we've identified. Growth, Definitely to match the ambitions for expansion, optimizing costs or even restructuring debts, and tax planning is critical. Professionalizing family governance, very, very important amidst the governance gaps identified. And those could include just even codifying values, having them written down as opposed to just thinking them reviewing your board composition so that they are more independent 
and there is infusion of additional knowledge wow. into the next generation who are probably represented on the board. And also embracing next gen family members are essential to the company's legacy. On delivering on ESG goals, important that we're prioritizing the welfare of employees because those are the greatest staff of the, organi of, of the organization or assets of the organization. Moving beyond traditional sustainable policies to strategizing and measuring impact critical, communicate, communicate, communicate. We cannot overstate that. And lastly, as an immediate action, family businesses must begin to transform their digital capabilities. Less talk, more action. And start by making digitalization a priority for your business. I thank you very much for listening to me. And on this note, I'd like to introduce Taiwo Oyedele, who is our fiscal policy no, okay. partner and also Africa tax leader to okay. moderate the panel session where okay. we will discuss insights okay. coming okay. from the survey. So over to you, Taiwo, and thank you all for your time. Thank That's you so very much, Isiri. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, I say welcome to everyone, and, and also particularly welcome to this panel session. Um, I have joining me for the session three eminent um, guests. Um, first, Mr. Kabiru Rabiu, who is the Group Executive Director of Boa Group, as well as um, um, ASR Africa, which is Abdul Samad Rabiu Initiative. Thank you and welcome for joining us. Next, I have Mrs. Nena Obia Jesse, Group Executive Director of Nestor PLC, as well as Obi Jackson Foundation. Thank you, Madam, for joining us. And last but not the least, my colleague, Rukaya Erufai, who is the Sustainability and Climate Change Leader at PwC. So we have just about 30 minutes. There's a lot we need to go through. I would encourage uh, the panelists to be very brief in their responses so we can cover as much as possible. Uh, based on the overview provided by uh, a series, I'll just build on that. And, and maybe where I should start is the fact that they believe that delivering positive societal impact by giving back and the sacrificing returns is, is changing because we're beginning to see things differently. Companies, investment managers, investors, and civil society are increasingly considering uh, value from the angle of contribution to society. Uh, so therefore, there's also the global shift and focus uh, to issues like climate change, pollution, human rights, and equality. Uh, so, and it makes sense because returns on investment uh, is dependent on a conducive environment and a thriving society. Uh, for the ESR Africa, um, we know that you guys are doing a lot uh, in the area of education, health, social development. For Obi Jackson Foundation, there's also health, education, social welfare, nutrition, and empowerment. So the question I'm going to ask, my first question will go to both uh, Mrs. Obi Jesse and Abiru Rabiu. And is what is really the motivation, uh, or call it the philosophy, uh, shaping your family philanthropy? Why are you doing what you're doing? Let's start with Mrs. Obia Jesse, uh, they say, uh, lady first. Thank you very much, uh, Taiwo. Um, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you very much for my being a part of this. So um, to take your question, what is it that is motivating this um, a philanthropy, you know, by my family? Um, the very first one is, you know, our very strong belief in God. You know, we, we strongly believe that God has provided us with talents and resources, and it's not just for us. 
you know, at the end of the day, we're going to be asked. Um, we're not going to be judged by how much we influence ourselves, but what sort of impact we have made in the lives of others. So we believe that whatever talents that you have, whatever resources you have, you need to share it. You need to use it to make impact in the lives of others. That's when you can really say that you have truly lived. That's the very first one. And then the very, as another one is that, you know, the community that we operate in, you need to check what sort of impact that you're making. Because if you do not make impact in those communities, how do you ensure the long-term sustainability of your operations? You're not, you're not really, you're never going to be welcome. And if you're not welcome, how does the business continue in that place? And then, you know, number three, if you do not take care of the community around you, the people around you, how do you ensure that, you know, in terms of maybe people have the right um, help, you know, have sufficient health care, educated enough, how would that value, how would you be able to harness that value to also make an impact even in your own business? So it's all about, you know, ensuring that we're making use of the talents and the gifts that God has provided us with, and then just ensuring that, you know, the community around us that we touch it. Mm -hmm. So I think this, these are the primary drivers. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. Um, let's take um, Mr. Kabiru Rabio, your thoughts, please. Thank you so much, uh, Tayo. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone uh, on the panel and, the, you know, the audience. Um, you know, the, the, the philosophy and the motivation really uh, to give back for us, you know, is, you know, is a, is a natural desire, really, to be honest, uh, to give back. Uh, we strongly believe uh, but as individuals and businesses, you know, we have a responsibility, you know, uh, our individual responsibility, you know, to say that we do give back and, you know, make better where we can, uh, you know, for our communities, the environments we operate in, uh, so on and so forth. And yes, we've been blessed. You know, we have, you know, sizable businesses, you know, uh, across the country and we believe a lot of these things we can't just leave them you know uh to the government there's some there's so much we can do both as businesses as uh, as well as individuals and you know nigeria requires you know so much nigeria requires so much and uh, if we feel that you know we are able and you know we are, we have the capacity and the resources to give back you know to make people's lives better in terms of you know better provision of healthcare um, you know, education, you know, I, why not? That is number one. And number two, you know, like the previous speaker just mentioned, really is about sustainability. Uh, sustainability is so important in that you cannot do business, you know, and make so much money, you know, in an environment, you know, without really giving back, you know, for us, it really doesn't make sense. So by, you know, intervening in those, you know, uh, communities and environments, you know, you're empowering people. You know, uh, definitely, be, you know, you'll be a lot more welcomed, but more importantly, you, you know, you give them more ability to, you know, for them, for them to, you know, afford and, you know, acquire and buy, you know, products and services that, you know, uh, you do. So these are the main, you know, two main, uh, you know, motivations, you know, for us, uh, at ASA as well as for our foundation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I really like the point about, we need to collaborate and support government. I think it's easy to just criticize government and everything around and not ask ourselves or look in the mirror and say, what are we doing? Now only two way. So that is really very commendable. Let me turn it to Rukaya. And I think this point has also been mentioned by both uh, speakers uh, who have speak spoken before. Do you see a business angle to philanthropy or is it just about giving back and how do you think that uh, we can measure impact? Hello. Thank you, Tayo. Thank you, uh, you know, my fellow distinguished uh, panelists. Um, it has a bit of both. Like you rightly mentioned, this was echoed by the, by the panelists. So there is the aspect of giving back, yes, because you know, with sustainability, there's always that inward view and there's the outward view. But there is big business benefit to it. You know, uh, as Mrs. Obey Jesse mentioned, 
it gives you the social license to operate. Um, you know, the inclusive growth and development of the external environment matters. We mentioned health and education. Human capital is critical for businesses to thrive. Um, you know, and like Mr. Rabiu rightly mentioned, you know, sustainable development is no more a business, uh, a government affair only. And that's the beauty of the SDGs is PPP led um, as opposed to the MDGs. So, you know, it, it, it's really, you know, about creating, you know, shared value, you know, that includes, you know, uh, you know, societal and economic outcomes. But it also helps with brand and reputation. When you look at the market capitalization, it has shifted from, from being more from uh, physical assets to intangible assets. So brand and reputation matters a lot. Both panelists have echoed that, how, you know, they, 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 you know there's done, there's, the brand becomes more receptive. And, you know, being part of the community as well, it provides that avenue to be part of the larger co community and even in business, you know, and you, know, you, you would understand that um, uh, uh, terrain. So, you know, when you look at it, it's about, it, it does um, help in, in value creation. Um, so, you know, which is also shared. So, yes, you are giving back, but you are also, you know, um, um, getting so much back in, in return. So for, for the second aspect, which is how to measure impact, well, Measuring impact, there's a materiality angle to it, there's stakeholder centricity angle, and of course, you know, there's that desire to create change. So when you're going to, um, you should measure your impact and your starting point should be establishing what's material impact to you as a business. And this shouldn't be done by you, only you, the company or the philanthropy. It should be have, you know, a stakeholder engagement process, a robust one to it, where you have a balance with your internal stakeholders too, and you're trying to concentrate on that intersect between your internal stakeholders and external st stakeholders. So, you know, you, the when you, and, and when I say the theory of change, it needs to be results-based. So you're looking at all the past possible pathways to creating that change. If it is, you know, better educational outcomes, better access to education, whatever, map out all those possible changes and then, you know, do the impact pathway analysis, determining, you know, what's the input ultimately and all those activities that drive to, drive to the outcomes. Then, you now set your indicators that should be smart. Then you set your target. You know, and then you, you have your baseline and you build in the continuous measurement and communication. As, as, as you mentioned that communication, you know, I, I, as part of her conclusion, many people, in fact, when you engage companies and you see what they're doing, you just be amazed and in awe, you know, people are doing so much. So it's also important to communicate these impacts you're exerting, you know, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really very useful. I, I think, you know, once we focus on outcome and we measure progress that we're making, not only are we getting value for the investment because it's really an investment in society, it also uh, maybe in a way help us to stretch ourselves to be able to do more. So let me uh, move on to issues around governance and sustainability. Uh, which also was highlighted in the analysis uh, that a series presented. So our survey shows the need for a professional governance structure for family businesses and their philanthropic initiatives. While globally 79% say they have some form of governance procedures in place, in Nigeria this is only true for 50% of family businesses. This figure is even lower when you start looking at Key areas such as whether you have shareholders agreement, only 28% in Nigeria. Do you have a family constitution or protocol? Only 9% in Nigeria. 
and there are also uh, social and governance concerns around tax honesty. So I was, I was happy to hear that family businesses in Nigeria, despite uh, all the challenges we face and the fact that people say, why should I pay tax, are still willing to pay their taxes. So while more than half, 55% of respondents uh, saw the potential for their businesses to lead on sustainability, only 37% globally, and in Nigeria, only 16% actually have a defined strategy in place. So this is good intentions, but not supported by any strategy. So let me ask Mr. Kabiru Arabi, uh, what's your strategy to ensure that there's a robust governance structure in place for your philanthropic efforts so that it can be sustainable in the long run? Thank you so much, uh, Tayo. You see, um, philanthropy and uh, CSR actually is a very is a very serious business, and uh, you know you need to put in you know um, you know processes and you know uh, and procedures and governance in place to make sure that it is not only sustainable but that you know uh, it is working. You are making you are creating the impact you know, that is intended to, you know, to create. So you have to have, first and foremost, you have to have very, very good auditing system, you know, in place to make sure that whatever net or whatever dollar you invest, you know, into your CSR actually goes down, uh, you know, to the intended purpose, number one. And more importantly, you have to be able to have the right people, you know, driving it, uh, both as, you know, at the management level as well, you know, as the board and trustee, you know, level. I think those these two things are very important. But at the end of the day, governance is a process. You know, uh, it's a process that you know you continue to you know to do to make things better. Uh, as you know, the in our own case, as the foundation grows, and you know the amount we intend to you know uh, to put, you know, uh, you know to work, you know, uh, grows. So it, it it is a process. It is a process. And I don't think, you know, it's a process that, you know, at one point that you say you reach the end of it. So you keep on, you know, doing it, you keep on making it better to make sure that, you know, you create that impact, you know, uh, that you desire, you know, for the, you know, for the course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much. Now, let me turn to Mrs. Obey Jesse. Our survey indicates that the next gen, are interested in philanthropy with a purpose. So for them, maybe they are motivated slightly differently from the rest of us, which is understandable. So from your perspective, are you seeing interest from the next gen in your family to get involved? And if so, what do you think is motivating them? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tayo. So I think I, I would take this by you know, giving a very little example. So um, in, in the Obi Jackson Foundation, there are several, um, um, you know, causes that we take upon us. One of them is, you know, what we call, you know, the, the prisons, you know, visitations. And, you know, that's like supporting the prisons with, you know, um, health care, you know, different kinds of things. And my, my daughter, who... Um, just graduated um, just a few months ago, um, you know, decided to take up a very important course, which even I didn't about my mind too, which is about, you know, the prisons, the female prisoners. What are we doing about their feminine care? And when we talk about feminine care, specifically um, about menstruation, you know, because she's like, I know what I go through, you know, during my period, and I know, you know, sometimes I need to, you know, invest so, you know, buy a lot of, you know, the sanitary towels that are required, the medicines for the pain killing. How are the women in prison actually doing this? And, you know, she started, you know, she, she now set up, um, in fact, she's been up most nights, you know, trying to work on setting up, you know, a foundation that is going to tackle this. And not just tackling this this way. She also wants to be able to go out there to bring awareness to see if she can even do anything to influence policy to begin to care for these women. And I said to her, how is it? I mean, why are you, why, why, why are you being driven by this? And she said, you know, mommy, um, many years ago when I was very small, one of my birthdays, you yanked me to the prisons to go celebrate it with them. 
And, you know, so that kind of, it's, um, it's remained on her mind. It's like, how, what can I do? So this one, so even though we have the more generalistic thing we do for the prisons, now she's, she's getting specific. She wants to tackle this issue, but not just to tackle it by, okay, we'll go and provide sanitary towels. But she's looking at how will it even be sustainable? So she's thinking, how can she influence policy? It could be like, you know, becoming an influencer, speaking to, you know, just different, different things to be able to bring to light, you know, the plight of the women in, you know, in prisons. And so I think that what has motivated this is, you know, um, you know, the next generation in my own family, yes, they are certainly very much interested beyond my daughter, the other, um, the, the rest of, you know, um, the, the younger ones in the family by what they have seen us do. And the fact that we allow them to, you know, to participate, you know, so that's kind of, by watching what we've done, they're like, you know what, we can also do this. And, you know, to also ensure that even our own programs are sustainable, because now she's talking about prisons. One of the things I said to her, you don't have to set up your own foundation. You know, we can see how do we collaborate? Because, we're interested in prisons. You're interested in this specific aspect of the prison. So we can, you know, do things together and, you know, um, at the end of the day, still serve, you know, this very, you know, great purpose. And why I mentioned, you know, this collaboration thing, to allow the children, the next generation, to be interested in what you do, not just in the philanthropy, but also in the, you know, uh, in the business. You need to be sure what is it that appeals to them. You need to ensure that you know you um you don't you don't um you don't really get what they are on what's driving them you can't really get it you need to see how do you inculcate it into what you do and at the end of the day you know that would sustain their interest for the long run and hopefully you know that will go from generation to generation mm -hmm. yeah this is really very interesting i think i like the perspective of just looking into something that many of us haven't talked about before or we just take for granted. So hygiene of people in prison, that's really for me, uh, that's that's very um, commendable. Um, and I do agree with you. Let's find a way to align their purpose and what they want to do rather than trying to box them into our idea of philanthropy. So I think that's the right approach. We're looking forward to see more uh, in that regard coming from her and then you supporting her and then the rest of the foundation. So Thank let me, you. as we wrap up, time flies for some very strange reasons. So <laughs> uh, we only have about nine minutes left. So globally, companies are focusing more on demonstrating their commitment to ESD principles, that is environmental, social, and governance. So the private sector has a critical role to play in delivering a more sustainable and prosperous future, which is in the need for impact investment and is growing rapidly. So let me start with you, madam. Um, and the question I want to ask you is, so on one hand, and uh, Rukai also mentioned this, communication is important. What are your thoughts uh, about balancing transparent disclosure to stakeholders and the public generally with the natural desire for family businesses to be private? How do you balance that? Thank you, Taiwo. So when you think, many times when people hear family business, what you think is just me, my father, my mother, you know, my children, that's it, everything, you know, shrouded in secrecy. But that's, it's beyond that. If, if, if it's shrouded in secrecy, if there are no, if you're not transparent, how can, how can your thoughts, how can your plans, how can it get to the next level? How can it succeed, you know, generation to generation? So basically, we're, we're, what, we're, what we're seeing and what we're actually doing as well is, you know, moving away from the old mindset of it has to be, we need to be in a straight jacket. If you're not transparent, how do you gain the confidence of your stakeholders and stakeholders, including even the, your workforce? How do you do that? If you're not transparent, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, how do you get your business to the global platform? So this transparency means that you need to ensure at each point in time, and not just you, there need to be ways to measure it by outsiders. 
that you are, you know, whatever it is that you're doing is measuring up to that international standard, which is what is going to allow the business to transit from one particular generation to another one. And, you know, the key thing is something to, you know, transparency. And, you know, I like to give examples. So some years ago, you know, a business was like, well, you can get to Okafor and Okafor or, you know, Jones and Jones, whatever to do, you know, our, our look into our financials, in you know, our auditors and all. And at some point we're like, no, we need to ensure that whatever we're doing, that the world can look into understand how well we're doing with our business. And even people will be in a, an opportunity, you know, will have an opportunity to, you know, um, add value because what someone doesn't know, how can, you know, if a doctor doesn't know what's wrong with you, how would he know what to do, you know, what treatment to give to you? And so we said, we're going to approach the big four. And, you know, we actually, it was to PwC we came to and we said, you know, we want, we want you guys to come in to take a look at our books. And I tell you, there was a lot of scrubbing that needed to be done because even before they started, they said, are we ready? Because unless you want a qualified report, everything will, you know, fall apart. And we're like, yes, we're ready. You know, I tell you, it was a very tough journey, but we're very happy, you know, because now it's not just us assuming that this is how healthy we are. This is how well we're doing. This is what value we're bringing to the stakeholders. Every other person is able to make, you know, that measured judgment. So it's something that if, you're, if your business is going to grow from or transit from one particular generation to another, you must be transparent. It's no longer, you know, the business can be a mom and pop one. It mm. needs to be private business in that decisions are quicker, but with a global outlook. Mm. I think, you know, and global way of doing things. I think that's yeah, how I want to yeah. Yeah, great, great. I think the dimension of getting an independent person who has the right knowledge to tell you what you're doing, you know, sometimes it may not be what you want to hear, but the fact that you guys were prepared to say, just tell us whatever it is, uh, is because you want to do well. That's the reason you brought in an expert to be able to tell you areas for improvement. So I think that is really good. Let me ask Mr. Rabi for his take on the same question, and that is really about how do you balance communicating what you're doing to everyone uh, versus the natural desire to be private, uh, say, family business? So I think, uh, you know, transparency and, you know, things such as uh, ESG are at the core of sustainability, you know, uh, to be honest. Uh, you can do things, especially for private businesses when you're a certain, you know, size, but, you know, the more you grow, uh, the more there's need, you know, to inculcate a culture of transparency within and outside, you know, the organization, because that's, I, I think is the only way that you can, you can make the business, uh, you know, uh, grow, uh, you know, because after some time, then, you know, it, it becomes even difficult for you to know 100% what is going on, you know, uh, within the organization when it's so large. So, but once you have, you know, the culture of, you know, transparency, everything, you know, uh, simply, simply flows. And I think, you know, it's in the best interest, you know, of the business and the organization and, you know, the owners and all the stakeholders to make sure that, you know, uh, that, you know, transparency is enshrined in, you know, uh, the core fabric, you know, uh, you know, the culture, uh, of each organization. It, it, it's not, it can be quite inconvenient, you know, um, mm -hmm. When you first start, I mean, especially when you have a private business where you do things, you know, somehow, but once you're used to it, once you, you know, is deeply embedded, you know, the culture of the, you know, organization, it becomes easy, you know, it, it becomes ju just a normal way, uh, of doing things. And I think, you know, both the stakeholders as well as the business, you know, to stand to benefit immensely, uh, from, you know, from the transparency, you know, in the organization. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with you. I think, you know, sometimes the challenge that we also have in this environment is people think that there's so many people out there who are doing philanthropy for social media and online. So they take photos, they do videos, they move on. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if you have substance behind what you're doing, I think we should all be proud about it. We should communicate it transparently. And then uh, maybe that would also even encourage other people to do the same. Let me ask Rukaya. So you've been working with many organizations around sustainability. 
Uh, and from our study, we see that uh, Nigerian businesses, including family businesses, uh, really want to do a lot more uh, and better than the actions they have on ground to support their aspirations. So in your own view, what do you think, maybe one thing, that family businesses can do or do differently to sustain their family business and uh, their philanthropy initiatives? <laughs> Thanks, uh, Taiwan. Very interesting conversations um, so far. There is a silver bullet, and that silver bullet is what the survey reveals that you know they, they 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 don't have or they're not willing, which is to have a sustainability strategy. And I'll explain why. I mean, from the survey, it, sustainability. I think there's that intent since it's part of the top top five key priorities. And you know, I think there's another uh, intent which is important from the survey, which is rethinking. You know changing or adopting their business model. So the silver bullet here is to do that sustainability strategy. So sustainability is often misunderstood, but, and I will try to demystify it in just you know uh, uh, two minutes. You know, sustainability is about longevity. It's about you know, setting up purposeful organizations that are built to last with long-term value creation that is shared you know, uh, 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 you know, not only long term, and you know, it's it's bal it's about creating that balance, and 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 this balance is in two ways because you're looking at, you know, you're you're not only thinking at, uh, at your organization in silos, you're developing that strategy, looking inward, out and outward in. So if you take environment, for example, you're thinking inwards around your health and safety and you're thinking outwards around how you're polluting the planet. Mm -hmm. And the other perspective of that balance is the dimension. So you're trying to strike the balance of creating shared value for people, you know, prosperity and the planet. And both are all inwards for yourself as an organization to your profits, for example, taking prosperity and externally through job creation, to paying your taxes, um, uh, the uh, value addition you're doing to the, the, the country's GDP and so, and so forth. And that's where you bring that EESG lenses, the economic environment, social and governance. But, you know, I mentioned earlier sustainability is stakeholder centric. So you do that by also in an inclusive way, but it's also very um, data centric because you, we just finished talking about reporting and disclosures. There's GRI, there's standards to it, and they prescribe, you know, how to, to, to report and, you know, it's very data centric, including qualitative data, so not only quantitative data. So, for example, you have to me measure and disclose, disclose your emissions, your carbon emissions, or, you know, your lost time to injury, maybe from your operational facilities and all that. But you know that there's that communication and there's trust to it, you know, and when you look at all this, you would see that that's really the silver bullet because mm -hmm. if you do develop that sustainability strategy, you integrate because the most matured form is in that integrated thinking. So sustainability is embedded in each and everything you do. And if you also take that to your philanthropy, you're also trying to, to you know, create that long-term value and also thinking of impact and thinking of, you know, what they call stakeholder capitalism. So you're not, it's capitalism but that includes stakeholders. Thank you very much. Yeah, awesome, awesome. I like the aspect about you need to integrate and it has to be integrated thinking. So uh, if you don't have structures and everything is just resting on one or two people, nobody is immortal. So therefore, uh, it won't be sustainable. So that's really very useful. So uh, we only have two minutes left. So unfortunately, I will only be able to take one question. I have one interesting question here from Bayo Adeyemi and, and his question is, this thing about wanting to increase tax compliance by family businesses was really driving it. But I would like, I'll tweak that question a little bit. I'll ask um, Madam, Mrs. Obia Jesse, 
uh, Mr. Tabiru Rabi to answer this question. And that question is, if you have a choice between paying taxes to government or using the money to take care of society, which would you prefer and why? <laughs> So maybe uh, let's 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 take Mr. Kabiru uh, first. I don't know whether we've lost him. Yeah. Okay, so maybe Madam can go first. I think we've lost uh, Mr. Kabiru temporarily. Wow. That's a that's a, a very tough one. So, um, years ago, I had that mindset that number one, my understanding of taxes is taxes you will pay it, and the people that is being paid to will use the tax to ensure that you know certain. In fact, that you use it to provide for the masses. They'll use it to provide, you know, um, for the communities. They would use it, they'll use it properly. They'll use it, you know, for a long-term, you know, capital projects or whatnot. And then you, 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 you're taking a look, you're finding that some of those um, capital items, you're providing for them yourself. You know, healthcare, you have to go out on a limb. Um, Electricity, you have to go out on a limb. You know, all those roads, you know, you, you look around you. Sometimes you have to fix the one in front of you. And then you're wondering, you know, and then you're looking around and you're seeing the masses that there's no social security, you know, of any sort to support them, you know, appropriately. So you're seeing all this need and you're wondering, so why, why am I paying this? I and mean, meanwhile, there's this other need. I need to make provisions. How do I, how do I alleviate the suffering of those? Who those taxes should actually, you know, the taxes should have been used to, you know, do that allegation. That was their mindset. But, you know, um, I, you know, I, I and you know the rest of you know um, the, the, the members of, of my team, we had to say, you know what, let's do our own part. Mm -hmm. So our own part is we pay the taxes, mm -hmm. deprive ourselves of whatever portion of it that should come to us to also make provision. So at the end of the day, because you see, two wrongs don't make a right. And you say that you have to lead by example. So if we say, you know, and, and I'm going to really talk about the environment. I mean, many times you hear, oh, Nigeria is bad, Nigeria is this, Nigeria is that. Nigeria is not, it's not an abstract term. Nigeria, it's people that actually make up Nigeria. So if I begin to do the right thing and others start to also do the right thing, at the end of the day, we'll be able to bear that cat. We'll be able to fix that Nigeria. So I'm not going to short change on taxes. And when we talk about transparency, that's actually one of those things we actually have to be sure of. Whatever the taxes are, pay it. If there are credit notes to obtain, make sure you follow through to get those things. But all those taxes, whether it's whatever, you just pay it so that that way you know you've done your own part. So I'm not going to take what I need to use to pay the taxes to give to the poor masses because some of those collecting the taxes are not doing what should be done with it. No, let me teach them properly. So I will pay my taxes, then deny myself to provide for those masses and then speak up when I need to speak up to say, hmm. guys, you need to also do your own part. This taxes, what are you doing with it? Hmm. Any opportunity, hmm. you know, what are you doing with it? This is what you should be doing with it. So it mm -hmm. can be take this to mm -mm. do your own part first, and then also take care of the masses. Take care. Yeah. Of awesome, the awesome. Around. I really, I really love your response. So it's not one or the other; it's both. Uh, we do it honestly. We set examples, and then we try to hold government to account so they stop wasting the our hard-earned money. <laughs> So because, again, government, by doing the right thing, has more skill to, to impact everybody um, than uh, individual organizations can. So thank you very much. Um, so I really uh, want to close now. So I want to appreciate you, uh, Madam, um, particularly waking up very early where you are to join us for this meeting. And then for Mr. Kabiru Rabiu, 
have to be in and out of uh, board meetings. So really appreciate that sacrifice and commitment. And to my colleague, uh, Rukaya, excellent insights. Thank you a lot. Um, and thanks to everyone, uh, including our audience and, and uh, other panelists. So I'll yield the floor back now virtually to Uma to conclude the, rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taibo. Uh, what an interesting uh, discussion, uh, Taibo, and our eminent panelists. And thank you again for taking the time uh, to share your views and insights. I now invite Claire Stelzaka to deliver the closing remarks. Claire is a partner and solicitor at PwC UK and private and family wealth leader. She advises international private clients and family offices on a wide range of succession planning and related legal matters. She is viewed as one of the leading private client advisors in the UK. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Uma, and thank you for those lovely words. And thank you to all of you today for allowing me to join and say the closing words. It's a real honor to be here. And um, I've absolutely loved uh, sitting in on this session and listening and learning and reflecting on the messages today. There's been some great, some great thoughts here. Um, you know, what's being discussed today is being discussed across the globe. It's uh, These themes are coming up time and time again. And when I work with families, both in the UK and in other countries, and actually I work with families in Nigeria together with the team that's here today, so I know the Nigerian market well, the, these these topics keep on coming up. And when we uh, launched the, the survey globally a, few, a couple of months ago, uh, one of the speakers who launched our survey was Victoria Mars from the Mars family. And she said something that really stuck with me. She said, the world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today. And I thought that was just a really, really um, appropriate uh, comment to make right now. You know, we've had one of the toughest years across the globe with COVID, um, and that's been against a backdrop of other geopolitical risk factors that are causing real challenges for, for ourselves and for our businesses. Alongside that, we're living in a society where change is just so fast paced and it's hard to keep up with it. But we're, we're all carrying on, we're all surviving. But for how long, I guess, you know, change is always there. The challenges are there. This year has been particularly tough. And, and you know, we don't, we don't know what's around the corner. So as a business, as a family business, trying to find your way through this and trying to work out how you survive and thrive, most importantly, is really, really important. And I think the themes coming out of the survey are absolutely the right themes to be focusing on going forwards. You know, we started off with Aziri uh, talking about the business model and the really important need for businesses to look at how they diversify to protect against risks in different sectors or in different countries. Thinking about how you improve cost efficiencies and looking at how you restructure your business, both in Nigeria and overseas, to really take advantage of opportunities, but also to become more resilient for future challenges. We talked about digital. You know, technology is just changing so rapidly and it's just an area that we all have to engage with and, and connect with and think through how we can use digital uh, technology to really transform our businesses and our approaches. And Zuri's absolutely right. It's time to really kind of get on with this now and start putting, putting that digital agenda off. And the area which I personally find most fascinating around ESG and some really great thoughts on, on that today on around how do we achieve sustainable businesses and certainly we see in other, country, in other countries across the globe that many family businesses are looking at the, uh, the sectors they operate within and trying to really think through how can they operate on a more sustainable basis? What can they do to affect real change? So I think those are definitely the three core themes to focus on to enable your businesses to be very successful in the future. But I think to enable you to think through strategically, how do you get there? This is where governance comes in. I'm a big advocate of family governance. I think it's so important within a family business setting. And I think right now it's more important than ever before. How you as a family have the time to think, to talk, to make decisions is so critical right now. There's so much to deal with and there's so much opportunity. And you need time to reflect on that and work through what your personal strategy will be. And that's the whole purpose of a good governance framework. Creating forums where you can meet, where you can talk, where you can make decisions in a balanced and in a transparent way is really, really key right now. And so I'd really advocate that for many of you on this call, if you haven't really got a real, really good governance uh, framework in place, both at family and at business level, now's the time to really start addressing that and thinking through and taking advice from others such as us and from, from peers around what could your governance framework look like and how could it work within your family to enable you both at current generation and next generation to really think through how you want to shape the, the future of your family and the future of your business. 
So governance is the bedrock to all of this. And um, I think it's going to be key to enabling families to communicate better and to work out strategically how they how they really embrace the future. So I hope we've given you lots of food for thought today. I've certainly really loved being part of it and hearing our panelists speak. And thank you to everyone for your time today. Thank you. Thank you again. And we are closing the event now.